contextual modernity. If modernism everywhere has been as much a product of history as of a visual style, then our modernity also need to be viewed from that angle that we could not deny the circumstances which Sri Kumar has spoken of. The individual could not deny the circumstances. The circumstances had again two components. The circumstances as socially available. When uh, an individual moves in the surrounding, he is within the he is operating within the circumstances. But an artist also operates within the visual circumstances. And the visual circumstances give him the languages, give him the language. When he as an individual reacts, he reacts with two circumstances, the visual circumstances and the actual social circumstance. He has to see whether the visual circumstances as he experiences can be represented in any way, manner, represented by the lang linguistic circumstances he has inherited he finds inadequacies. He looks beyond for linguistic elements and then he has to, he has to develop an individual language which willy nilly becomes eclectic as Jogan has pointed out. Because not all of what he inherits as visual circumstances can do justice to what he feels as an individual within the circumstances. So he has to develop his own language. To my mind, Manida has done it wonderfully well. And the most, Manida had several different styles through his career. He has not arrived at this, at this style all on a sudden, or that it has been continuing for a long time. No, he had different styles at different periods of time. Now, but there is one common core linguistic element which had been running through all his work. And what is that? That you can find, that, that you can find in his configuration, not so much in what he does with his individual uh, images, but how he configures. And this configuration makes his <coughs> works, narrative works, the co configuration that he developed makes his painting uh, some kind of narration. He, uh, within one canvas or within one pictorial space, he makes several pictorial spaces, not one, several, and they are in grooves, they are in different spaces. Within the same pictorial space, he makes several different spaces, places his images in different spaces, and they interact specially and makes a story. And most of
what he comes up with? He comes up with a commentary as an observer of the circumstances he has experienced mm -hmm. as a social being. Mm -hmm. He follow his gaze and then he, his gaze is that of an observer of events where men, women, birds and beasts act out their roles funnily. He takes his gaze is, a, is of an observer who is also a commentator. He takes immense pleasure in looking at follies and foolhardiness and queer acts of people in di different circumstances. This gaze is very important and this gaze comes through in his configuration, a special configuration. That to me is one great uh, binding thing of all his work through life, through the life. But Manida has been very many things together. He has been not only a designer, he had been illustrator, that element has been there in his painting and he has done that. He has been educator. He has been a great educator. Not only that, he was associated with, with two of the finest art schools of the country, namely Baroda and <coughs> uh, But then, but he was one of the three masters which, uh, who had built up Baroda school with an identity. He had been a student of Shantiniketan and he has been one of the most successful inheritors of the mantle of Master Master Nandolal Boshu, Vinod Bihari Mukherjee, and uh, Ram Pinkar Page. He continued the tradition, but contributed individually to that tradition. He was not only a continuer, he was a contributor. <coughs> That and not only a good teacher in an art school, I remember uh, about 20 years back, after hearing one of his uh, lectures, which he used to pack with anecdotes, humor, and all kinds of things, said, uh, at this age of mine, I uh, am considering you to be my latest guru. So I never taught you. I said, you don't have to teach. You teach always through your work, through your writing, through everything. So he has been my teacher. Though I have never been an institutional student of any art institution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, if you have something to ask, ask the uh, two, <coughs> um, one an illustrious art, art historian and another a great artist himself, you ask. Actually, actually I forgot to mention one thing, about the water chitra, you know, 
work has a lot of things connected with Patakitra, which is very uh, evident from all his work that Patakitra has greatly influenced him. Especially John Paul. Your um, source also. Can I ask something? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, to whom? It's addressed to Shri <laughs> Uh You mentioned about this uh, role of the viewer. Now, because you said that would help in bridging the communication gap. Now, this statement kind of presupposes. This presupposes that either there is or there could be a communication gap, right? So, I would like to know as a lay viewer how to comprehend this statement, to whether to comprehend it as a stance on the part of the artist to say, okay, when you are coming to view my works, better do your homework and do the basics so that there is no communication gap. Or, is it a kind of leeway and a freedom of interpretations that he generously allows where he would either accept the different interpretations or just listen to them and say, Lord, forgive them, they know not what they say. <laughs> That's one question. The other question is, what is his stance vis-a-vis -vis the intrusion uh, probably intrusion is not the fortunate choice of words, uh, the, the intercourse of other forms of art and other mediums with the traditional fine arts, what goes by the label of installation nowadays. So what is his stance on this kind of creativity? Uh, the, the first question, yeah. obviously what he means any language, now when we are speaking, I mean, maybe if you record it and try to put it down on a piece of paper, transcribe it, probably you'll see I have missed out a few words or grammatically maybe if I write I would not say it in the same way. But it doesn't impair communication because you are actually putting in all those little things that I might be missing. Okay. So any form of communication really is a two-way process that both of us share a little bit of the structure of this language and therefore I probably need not be perfectly correct when I speak. So what happens is that this can be an advantage for an artist. He can always expect the viewer to fill in a few things. Now some artists might not want that. There might be languages which are worked out completely so that when you come to view it, you just view it. I mean everything. It's like if I work out my statements, write it down and it's perfectly correct and you don't have to put in anything there. So there might be, for instance, an artist like say Abhinindranam. Now everything in his work is almost worked out. There might be ambiguities, but even that is worked out very clearly. You have to just view what he says very really. But in certain other cases, maybe you actually drop in. I mean, the example, for instance, one of the examples that the historian I refer to, Gombrich, when he uses the beholders share this concept, he gives is the paintings of Rembrandt. You think his portraits are so expressive, but he points out that most of Rembrandt portraits, the faces, the eyes are in dark and there are no details of the eyes. But it is what you do. Or when you look at something like a comic like Tintin, his eyes are just two dots and you play a role in putting in various expressions into it. But it's not that as if the artist hasn't done anything. The artist has let things stay at a point mm -hmm where the viewer can always put it and complete it. So this also allows, as you said, maybe to view a thing slightly differently. So the artist's intentions are not the final and the only thing. 
we are also participating in creating that image in certain ways. First at the level of language, then at the level of meaning. Both this do a lot. And as Jogendra said, in a sense, I mean, one of his predecessors in this was definitely Picasso. And uh, of course, there are differences between them and the way he went about it, and also differences with uh, say Nandalal, I mean, which again was something that he rightly pointed out. Nandalal was one of those Indian artists who realized that when you think about communication, you should have probably not stick to one level of language. So he looked at traditions, picked up various things, and worked at different levels and different styles. Now, what Picasso did in a sense, after his cubist kind of a thing, if cubism and the traditional Western modes, and maybe to a certain extent, say, the African and uh, oceanic sculpt paintings that he looked at, there were two or three different, totally different modes of work. He wanted to develop a mode of painting where the language is flexible enough so that he can move towards one or move to the other. I mean, you, so unlike Nandala, Subramanian develops a language which is much more flexible, but one single more organic thing, and which is flexible enough to move in different directions. And this was very important. This was very important for him as a painter. That is why he is able to work at these different levels of communication so easily. And uh, Picasso was one of the artists who did it, but he worked within those parameters, as I said, the traditions he was most familiar with. For Subramanian, it also meant a lot of the mm -hmm. Far East and many more. In fact, he's one of those artists who is more or less at home in different traditions of the world. And nobody probably has looked at so many. Ask him about the intercourse. Uh, yeah, the okay. And this is again, I mean, this is the one thing because he was for him. I mean, this again, in a sense, stems from Nandala <coughs> that the art craft divide is not important. But as I said that because Subramanian was looking at it from the point of view of language, he took it into a much larger framework. And in the time of our national struggle for freedom, Nandalal was somewhat constrained in some ways, as he himself admitted later in life, that because to stick to certain traditions, almost ideologically limit himself. But in the post-independence space, Subramanian didn't have to be to narrow himself. In fact, he opened himself much more to the world traditions. So what comes in, maybe within the same painting, you might have elements that which might remind you of Pat, which might remind you of Matthew, which might remind you of certain African things. And even the sculptures that, I mean, the toys that Pranodha talked about, in a sense, you have it in African traditions where wood and fiber and various other things are put together and where the materials also contribute to the meaning and feeling of things. And as Jogendra was saying, maybe like Mathis, he's doing different colors within the same thing. But within that, the linguistic structures are also being played at. Multiple colors might be relating to, I mean, light and therefore illumination, or it might be something that brings out a kind of expressive focus on the things. So there are these, I mean, I mean, border lines between different styles and languages, which he exploits very clearly. In fact, there is a tendency to do this, I mean, in Binod Bihari, that he to find out where are those border lines. So in a sense, as Pranavda was trying to say, he was somebody who was carrying forward the tradition and expanding it adding new elements and strands to it, making it much more, I mean, uh, vibrant in some sense. So uh, very often I think that in, he is the equivalent of Nandalal in post-independence India. What Nandalal was to pre-independence India, Subramanian I think plays a similar role as teacher, as somebody who explores the visual language, as somebody who kind of tries to bridge between this whole range of art practices. And therefore, for him, I mean, nothing is, as I said, that the 
what might be the official conceptions of art within art history or art practices keep shifting. But he doesn't look at it in terms of those shifting values which are bound to happen, but he is trying to look how as an individual trying to know and the world can use any of these things. So none of them would be kind of thing, even if they are not installations in that sense. But interestingly, if you look at the, I mean, the mural-like, I mean, the whole compass that he did in the, the Delhi Gandhi uh, Darshan, it has multiple materials in it. It has text in it. I mean, uh, it is relief, sculpture, visual kind of thing. And so, I mean, already was willing to kind of do, I mean, he started up almost as a purist modernist. But over the years, he has been able to kind of break that mold of modernism and work in these interspaces between various media and various levels of cultural community. Uh, can I add uh, a footnote to what uh, <coughs> she will just say? Well, strictly speaking, uh, this Subramanian hasn't done an installation.